You know where you are? is Appetite for Distortion. Welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion, episode number 408. My name is Brando. Welcome back to the podcast, Rocco Guarino. How are you, sir? It's been a bit. What's going on, man? How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, I apologize. I don't know if you hear baby Brownstone crying in the background. You may hear that as I'm in my apartment, uh, studio apartment here in Queens. Uh, I should say it's it's my studio in an apartment. I don't have a studio apartment, but who gives a shit? Uh, and I, I know you recently moved down to Nashville. If you're watching this on Zoom, you have some really cool stuff behind you. Uh, so is that where you're, you're currently in your new digs in, in Nashville? Yep, new spot, yep. Where were you before? Because if people don't remember, Rocco was a guest way back, episode 137. I had to remind myself where we spoke about your time with Velvet Revolver and Scott Weiland. Just uh, why the change? You were West Coast for the longest time, right? Yeah, I was in LA for 20 years. Damn. Yeah. And uh you know the music scene there doesn't really line up with what I'm into, you know. I mean, um you know, you got the Sunset Strip metal, you know, 80s stuff, which is fun, you know, but you know, it's like a, it's like a nice place to visit, but you don't want to live there, you know. Okay. And then you have the um the east side which is the hipster stuff and then uh like have a lot of hip-hop and i just was kind of like missing just like middle of the road tom petty guitar music you know led zeppelin just rock you know so and uh nashville just kept coming up uh in my life different different times conversations with people or whatever you know and um so i just kind of followed the signs you know so is there because I'm, I'm i'm ignorant is there a rock scene down there because i i think nashville i think country music like what's how diverse is it down there oh yeah man i i mean i've gone out a ton since i've been here and i only saw country music a couple times it's mostly it's, it's mostly uh well you know it's just where it go you know what i mean like so if you go down to broadway which is like the bachelorette party capital of the world um and there's like three four story bar after bar after bar and every floor has a band so it's it's, it's insane that's all covers right mostly 90 percent covers you know parties drinking and dancing and then you have east nashville which is where all the original music happens and i mean a good amount of it is rock you know there's there's a lot of really cool venues here you know, it's like the five spot and the Cobra and the basement, the basement east and the underdog and the Bowery Vault. And I mean, it's just on and on and on. There's so many venues. It's crazy. Uh, it's on. It's so funny I, that I have this podcast about GNR and I have yet to step foot inside California, let alone LA or any of that. It will happen one day. Uh, yeah. I keep saying that, but I know it it will. But in Nashville too, like a, a bucket list place I want to yeah. go do an experience. And we're gonna talk about a little bit later what you're doing down there now, other than just having a sweet pad. And I can't help but notice if you're watching this on the YouTube channel, because it's uh, as we're recording this, uh, I'm lucky I know what day it is, let alone date. But it's the uh, July 24th, and early. So about I think exactly three weeks ago was the anniversary of Libertad, the 16th anniversary of Libertad. So if you see the contraband, uh, I think the uh, the plaque behind you, but I, I don't know if you, we have any other velvet behind you, but I don't know. It just got me thinking, and we, we, we're cool enough. We follow each other on TikTok. I think it's the first time I've ever said that sentence. Yeah, uh, man, TikTok. So, so I'm just like, you know what? Let's get Rocco back on. We had a great conversation. So uh, yeah, appreciate it. So I guess 16 years later, we could talk more about wherever the story goes with Velvet. And if people don't know, uh, we had the, you came up with, although Duff came up with the term 
was the strategic a strategic liaison or something the what oh. that, your 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 title for velvet technology uh, I, when i went back the second time it was uh the joke was a uh, technology liaison because yeah. a lot of a lot of my time was just fixing everybody's uh blackberries you know uh, okay. <laughs> we had cameras the little eyesight cameras that went on top of your laptop before the cameras were built into the laptops so, I mean, yep yeah Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, I encourage people, if you missed that, and there, I, I'm flattered that I have listeners that go back and listen to every single episode, but it was a great one to learn about your story to go from uh, kind of the engineer on contraband, one of the engineers, this, uh, no, you weren't, I thought you were, so, how does it remind me that? Because it was Scott Weiland's assistant, but you weren't exactly Scott Weiland's assistant then first. You were doing some technical stuff in the studio, weren't you? I started out, um, Scott's partner at the time, Doug Grion, he was running the studio that they had together called Lavish Studios. Him and him, Doug and Scott had Lavish Studios. And then when I came along in like 2001 or two, I think it was two, 2002, um, I met Doug through a friend of a friend and he took me in and, and I started, uh, Working, you know, working, or, you know, volunteering, you know, uh, wasn't getting paid or anything, but you know, just taking out the trash and wrapping cables, making coffee. Oh, okay. Uh, for Doug, and and then Scott was out on tour uh, with STP. So then, um, two thousand later, two thousand two, Scott came back from tour with STP, and like later that year, someone said, "Hey, the guys from GR are gonna come by lavish tomorrow. Maybe talk to Scott about doing some kind of project." Or, and that's like when pretty much when my life changed at that point. They came in and slash walked, you know, all the guys walked in and they jammed and it was like fucking fireworks. And it was wild. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. Maybe I should go back. I listened to a lot of it because I, I make these clips and you noticed it. You commented on the TikTok, on some of my TikToks uh, to go back and edit some of the, your highlights. And maybe I should have listened to the whole thing because I, yeah, but it's good. Get a refresher of the story before we, we jump into everything yeah, yeah. else. I got sidetracked. Yeah, what were we talking about? Well, I, I wanted to go back into because as I I even just thinking about Libertad at that time, and it kind of always bothered me where that that well, Velvet kind of fell off at that time. This is before Scott, which you know, terrible, lost his life uh, through a drug and a, and a, drugs and addiction, which we spoke about at length at that time. But just that the band broke apart, and a lot of people hate on that album. And I put it on for the first time in a long time. And there are some really, another phrase I don't use ever, there are bangers on that, that record. So I, I would just love to hear some like memories you have. Of, and Because people also, if they don't remember, and I specifically made a highlight of this, you directed the Last Fight video, yeah. which was, uh, and you were, <laughs> you told a great story about how you, you told your mom that like, I have a top 20 or top 10 video on VH1 and very, very cute. So I would just love to hear some memories and can you believe it's been 16 years? That's crazy, man. That's really crazy. 16 years. It just, it just went by like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. My, well, my mom was, was actually at the video shoot, which was awesome. She flew out for it for, to be on set with me while I was directing it. And then, but I called her when it went top 10 and told her, and that was pretty, that was pretty awesome. Pretty awesome phone call. Um, Libertad. So, yeah, so I, I had, so, you know, I worked, I mean, I don't know, I guess we probably covered a lot of this in the first one. I should have, I should have listened to the first one too as well, because I don't know what we covered and what we did. I will but. say this, because we hit it off and maybe it's good that we rehash some of this stuff. Because and I do this too, so don't feel you know self conscious. We would deviate from the subject. Yeah. I remember like I asked you, for, and it seemed like maybe a half an hour passed by before you answered what happened with the last fight video. Some yeah. other stories kept coming up, and they were all great stories. But I'm like, I still got to get an answer to this thing. So yeah. I think maybe we can get some more concise. And again, I have this problem too. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. All right, so, so look at that. yeah. So anyway, I was just gonna say, I you know the whole rising through the ranks was the story uh, that I think we covered last time. 
but I don't know if it covered when I quit. So at, at a certain point, I quit. Um, I was Scott's assistant, and, and that's all I had done up until that point. It was just because of the system. And, you know, he never had one before, and I never was one before. So we were both kind of just trying to figure it out, you know? Well, maybe uh, before we even get into anything else, because whenever there's an opportunity to talk about Scott, Scott Weiland, the late, great Scott Weiland, I, I, we, got, we have to do it. His memory and legacy should live on. And I think there's a lot of misnomers out there. And we all, we know he struggled, but you and I, we spoke about addiction that I've been about, I think, almost eight years without alcohol. But I still have a very addictive personality. I talk about mental health. I was in therapy for 12 yeah. years recently stopped because it, I don't know. I, I don't have time to think about myself, my problems anymore with a kid. So I'm yeah. like, I'm at a good place in life. Let me focus on the now. Yeah, uh, and, and you told your story and you're with addiction. So with that in mind, what is it like being Scott Weiland's assistant and just to deal with that uh, the day in and day out? Um, I mean, I was fresh off the boat, you know, I just, just got to LA, uh, from the East coast. So the whole thing was kind of like a world, crazy whirlwind, you know? Um, and you know, I was a big fan, you know, uh, STP fan and it was wild, you know? I mean, I, I was just like renting a room in a house. I didn't have a lot of money and, you know, it started out just like driving them around and then. And then it just kind of, you know, built up from there. But uh, it was a roller coaster, you know. It was a roller coaster. I mean, it was emotionally intense. I think the only word to really describe that time was just fucking intense, man. It was, it was, you know, emotions are just like overwhelming. Just like, uh, yeah, I can't even describe it. It was, it was crazy. It was a lot of stress lot of pressure yeah what do you think was going on because we can never get inside someone else's head we all make up reasons about why someone may be depressed or self-medicating uh, i don't need to surprise i'm a jewish guy with mommy issues you know we all have you know and i talk about my disability and that affects me mentally but what do you think it was with scott that affected him the day in and day out was it the pressures of being a rock star uh was there do you think it was family stuff and you don't need to go into anything specific if it's, you know, uh, we don't need to reopen old wounds, but wh what do you think it was with, with Scott? Did he just always kind of have the personality you think of just where he could be very friendly and nice. And then other times he could just kind of be erratic. I didn't really have a frame of reference because I didn't know him in his twenties or anything like that, you know? So I don't know what, like what had changed or if anything had changed or maybe he was always like that or what. So I don't know. But um, you know, I think I think like like all of us, the things that make up our personality are half nature and half nurture, right? So like we're half of who we are, we're born, we're just born that way. And then the other half of who we are is how we're raised. And everything, everything goes back to childhood. Yeah. For all of us. And there's no escaping it. And it's as, as old as as old as the earth, um, and that's what it is: it's trauma, childhood traumas, and 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 whatever it is that we all go through. Um, and that's what that's what makes I think some of the best art. Is, you know, people are are. Well, I mean, we're all fucked up in the head, and we're all trying to just figure out how to get through our day. And and so some of us use you know different forms of art to express that. You know, to be able to purge that you know did you ever because while you were his assistant and you would book appointments for him and schedule things for him yeah did you ever kind of have those conversations with scott wyland as a as just a friend because you met because you guys had a it seemed to have a special relationship versus the other guys at least with and this uh i remember from the the previous interview when you did the last fight uh video it was Scott that really pushed for you to do it where the other guys weren't really sure. And Scott looked at you as this creative person and wanted to support you. So did you talk about private things or was it just all business and, and rock and roll then? 
sorry, I gotta turn this off. Um, you there? Okay, no, I'm here. I'm here. I think. No, no, we were, we were, we were friends. I mean, I, we spent literally every day together. You know what I mean? For many years. So, you know, uh, I was at his house every day, and we we're at the studio together every day, or at the gym, or the rehab, or whatever. Um, yeah, we talked a lot, you know, because I was clean and sober at the time. So, and, you know, it wasn't. So, we would talk a lot about that. We talked about everything that you would talk about with your friends, you know. Mm. We had a lot of long nights on the bus. I mean, whenever we were on tour, every band member had his own bus. So, Scott and I always had our own bus, which is the two of us. And it's a lot of hours, a lot of overnight long drives, you know, uh, you know. A lot of sharing, you know. So yeah, for sure. And this goes into the Libertad conversation because I re- I do remember who's Doug Rion, who's been a guest on this podcast as well, and and Dave Kushner from Velvet. They had mentioned that Scott had some paranoia about Guns N' Roses reforming, and then that that might have all bottled up into Libertad, and there's just like an uneasiness. So I guess from your perspective, you know. Was he worried about the state of the band going into that album? Do you recall or? No, I don't think so. I never heard. I, he never said anything to me about being worried about GNR reforming because. Okay. I, were, I mean, man, we were at the height. I don't know what the hell Axel was doing, but uh, I don't think he was doing that much in 2002, two, three, four, five dates. Maybe he was. I don't know. But I know that. No, no dude. The- 2000 that was an interesting time 2002 was the uh the pseudo comeback and then they canceled the 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 chinese democracy tour and then velvet revolver i mean that was my first opportunity ever to see slash and duff in person yeah uh, we're concerned about guns and roses whatever you want to call it which was like axel and his buddies no that wasn't really an issue okay all right that's interesting so yeah uh what Fond Matt, because other than the the video, of course, what else did you do working on uh Libertad and your involvement with just just being with Scott at that time? Uh his assistant. I also, I also um was sort of the kind of like the DP director of photography, sort of in a way, for another video called Get Out the Door. Basically, they took a bunch of my footage that I had shot on tour and studio and photo shoots just everywhere. And I gave all my footage to my buddy, Dean Carr, and he sort of oversaw the process of editing. Well, a killer editor um, that he used all the time. And so those two guys took that, and I think maybe Chapman Baylor might have shot some extra stuff. I'm not sure what the process was. All I know is I gave Dean all my footage that I had shot, and then he took that, and then and then when it came out, I saw other stuff that I had never seen that I didn't shoot. So, uh, and then put it all together and made the music video for Get Out the Door. So I don't know if I got direct, got, got I definitely was director. Technically, it was a mishmash. Uh, but yeah, so that was that one. Okay, cool. Um, another one of my favorite tracks off that record. So you were out on on, on tour for the Libertad. And uh, were you the same thing with Contraband as well? Yeah, so with Contraband, yeah. So that was like, not to retell the story, but yeah, that was when I first started working with Sky, and I didn't, right. just, you know, like we we're making the record, doing photo shoots, and blah blah blah. And then I started booking the tour, and the big question mark over my head was, am I going to go on a freaking world's tour, you know, with these guys, or am I going to do a job when he leaves? And uh, sure enough, that one I'll never forget the day in his kitchen when he asked me if I would go on on the road with him. That was amazing but anyway so yeah so that was that was contraband and then i quit and then some time went by and then i went back and then uh, uh anyway so with libertad um what was the question sorry well i was leading into well i asked you what if you were a ball on both tours which you you were so you answered the question but i'm, I'm kind of leaning toward did you see any difference in the band or what was your experience, I guess, the contraband tour versus Libertad tour contraband. Yeah. You're in this whirlwind thing. You didn't expect Libertad. You've been around the guys for a while and they know you. So maybe if you can compare the experiences on those two big tours. 
Yeah, contraband, I was Scott's personal assistant. And by the Libertad tour, I had gone back and I, they were, I was rehired to strictly just do uh, video and photos and basically follow the band around everywhere and, and shoot everything and then cut it up into little pieces, documentaries and webisodes and stuff like that. So, so, so yeah, the, the Libertad, I, I love that album. I think that album is great. You know, I mean, a lot of heavy stuff happened during the making of that album, you know, and there's a lot of, there's a lot more emotion. There's a lot more of Scott's, this is probably the most personal album lyrically that Scott ever wrote out of huh. any project or any band, you know. Wow. Libertad. If you listen to those words, man, you know, it's real. So, you know, he lost his little brother, Michael, you know, and Matt lost his little brother. Like, Scott got clean and, you know, just a lot of shit went down, man. And then, you know, it came off a massive world tour and the number one album and all that stuff. So we were, you know, we were on fire, you know, everyone was stoked and the band was tight as shit. And um, Brendan O'Brien was a genius. And Nick did the engineer did. We did it at Henson Studios. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of fun, a lot of fun doing that record. Well, it's 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 really cool to hear that you think this because Scott's written, he just with STP has written some of the greatest songs ever, and then you to say some people just like what I wanted to get across. Don't just throw away Libertad. Revisit that album, especially just look at the lyrics. Um, or contraband any day, absolutely. I think it's a way better album. It's a much better album. I mean, prove me wrong. I mean, it's just it's got the heavy shit. It's got the beautiful lyrics. I mean, it's the melodies. It's just a more evolved. I just think Contraband is like so basic. Contraband was just like a band making their, it's like their first album. Like they were just kind of figuring out things were pretty simple. You know, Jock Abraham produced it. So, you know, you're not going to get anything too amazing. It, it's just kind of basic, you know? I mean, the sound the sound of it was killer because Ryan Williams appeared it and he's, he's amazing. But, our child was just it was deeper man it was deeper there were layers to that and it was it was more evolved and as a band they were more evolved too i think yeah it's just overall it's just it's the next evolution of of the band i think yeah were you preparing after that tour an album for there to be further evolution were you surprised when uh scott was fired because of is uh, off the field issues, so to speak. Uh, what did you feel about the fate of the band when it happened? Um, yeah, I mean, I wasn't surprised when he, you know, I mean, if he quit or he he was fired, I don't know. The, the right. thing, the thing is, like, I it wasn't the first time. You know what I mean? Like, you know, how many times did he quit or get fired from SCP? Like, I didn't really think it was really going to stick. So, mm, okay. I, I was like kind of we were all just kind of shrugging our shoulders like yeah you know we'll see you next week you know but <laughs> didn't happen that way. so yeah i was surprised yeah okay uh yeah you're right um and just to use a because i used one baseball reference so off the field it just makes me think if, if you know the yankees this is before my time when they uh george steinbrenner hired and fired billy martin like seven times i mean it's it's, it's if you get the reference like i'm sure you'll appreciate it uh you i wanted to i would be remiss because i wanted to bring it up because as i mentioned we follow each other on tiktok by the way i don't want to go deep into it but apparently twitter is now x yeah which i uh, how do you feel about that i i don't i um, i don't have i you're I have, on it but you're not really active i have accounts and i think it probably goes there automatically when i post to other places but no i don't have the app on my phone and i have i don't use it i haven't used it in years I never, I never really used Twitter. I never really used to it. I don't know why well, it's it's turned bad, but I for whatever reason I just found it easier to connect with artists yeah. on there than on any other platform. But whatever, yeah. I'm on the other ones. I'm not on Threads yet. I'm just, it's too much. But on TikTok, <laughs> I had posted a video about Matt Sorum, and I think you you commented on that. It was from one of my really early episodes with. Uh, See, this is a perfect example with Charlie Benanti, who we asked to be on the show on Twitter. 
And he said yes. Or on the then Twitter, Rip Twitter on X, and just about his opinion with um, between Scott and uh, Stephen, Ad- excuse me, between Matt Sorum and Stephen Adler. And you wrote, Matt is an incredible drummer. I have a great story about working with him. So here's the opportunity. What's that great story? <laughs> My PayPal is Rocco Music. For no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so so no, he's just a machine, man. He's just killer. Like he, his sense of timing, it's crazy. Like so many drummers out there, just they're great drummers, but they don't have a good sense of time. And I know that doesn't sound like it makes sense, but there's right there's guys out there that can grow, they have the chops, whatever. But your song will speed up and slow down, like without fail, you know. Um, and then there's guys like Matt Swarm. So. One time I was in there with Kevin Smith, one of, one of my uh, good friends that I met through Matt. And he did a lot of engineering for Matt. And just like every time I work with Matt, when he's when I'm producing or whatever, or recording him or whatever, when he's on drums, I'm just, you know what I mean? Mouth it's, agape. Hi? Huh? Mouth agape. Sorry, I'm saying that for the podcast side. Did they even see your mouth drop? So yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. adding commentary. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, cool. So anyway, so Kevin and I were in there. So I said, watch this. And I, and I, you know, he's got Matt's out there doing a take recording and he's got the click and I fucking did the click. And, and I, and I played it off like something was wrong. And I was like, you know, through the window, I'm like, go, keep going, you know? Anyway. And then right, right before the end of the song, I put the click back in and he was right on it. It was wild. Like two minutes later, he's he he is the metronome. Hmm. So, I mean, that's just not so hard, man. It's wild. What about your opinion on this? And this was in the recent uh, in the news. I did not have uh, Nuno Betancourt versus Richard Fortas uh, feud in my 2023 uh, bingo card. I don't know if you've heard about this quote controversy. It's silly. It's you know, it's sports talk radio esque uh, because you've worked obviously with, with Slash. Uh, so, yeah. Nuno was interviewed and he had mentioned he was talking about his gig with Rihanna and yeah. how it's more difficult than people would imagine and how somebody like Slash couldn't do it. He praised Slash and his ability, but just something about like how someone like Slash couldn't do that kind of gig. And that, of course, makes headlines and it's to me that looks like, and this is that's only the first part of the story if you're not familiar. But to me, that's just kind of like opinion. It's not that big of a deal. I don't think Nuno was necessarily insulting to Slash, but it's kind of like Slash has played with countless pop stars, including well, what you, Rihanna. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Like, why, why did he feel like Slash would be able to do it? Let me <laughs> bring up the exact quote so I'm not paraphrasing poorly. Uh, just because he. He couldn't blend into a band or stand out too much or um I want to I want to make sure I, I, I get the exact oh. quote so da, 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 it's somewhere in my timeline which is great I know I can also look it up but damn it wish I had this wish I had like one of the times I had a producer uh to look it up for me but you know what? Let me look at the original article and see if I could find that because uh, I don't want to. Because what would eventually happens is that Richard Fortas defends him. And then when Nuno responds, that's when it gets bad. Okay, here we go. Uh, that was a beautiful stall. Um, it's, I'll edit, I could edit it out, but you know, that's, this is live radio, so to speak. So it says, this is when Nuno talking about Slash. I'm sorry, most of the guitar players who I admire could not in their lifetime play that gig. Talking about the Rihanna gig. I mean that in the most complimentary way possible. Slash is one of the greatest rock guitar players of all time, but I guarantee, and he'd be the first one to tell you, that if he jumps up and he's got to play a clean intro to Rude Boy from Rihanna, it ain't happening. So that's what he said. I'm not a musician. I'm not a guitarist. I don't know. It's just people. It's I, don't just, know song. I don't know what Rude Boy is. I don't know what that it's means. Just, well, just think about a, a Rihanna song or any pop artist just saying that he 
he would my get my interpretation is slash would have to put his spin on it would have to noodle you know noodle to he, he yeah. couldn't just play a, a song the way it's like it was pre-recorded or written yeah he's just saying yeah basically like you're a side man and slash is not a fucking side man you know what i mean yeah so that i think that's an okay thing to say but there oh, are people yeah but there are people, it's again, it's a fun sports talk ass kind of thing where they're like, oh, well, sure. slash play with Michael Jackson. You play with this person, Carol, play Carol King. It's just, it could yeah, have been a bad that, example. The things that he did, like what he did with Michael Jackson was just himself. He was just slash. He played. Sure. What he played. I mean, I wasn't there in the studio, but I mean, it sounds like him, you know, I think what Nuno's saying is, yeah, with Rihanna, like you're playing some random shit that has nothing to do with what you normally ever do. And you got to play it perfectly and you got to play it clean and you got to, it's just not his wheelhouse. It's like, yeah, no, I don't think, I don't think he, he would be good at it either. I don't think it would, it would be okay. weird. So yeah. it, it, it elevates to this then. So Richard Fortas, I don't know do you, if you know Richard. Yeah. He, he put this on Instagram. He took a, a headline, but I guess he read the article and listened to it in context. Yeah. And I think what he said was just fine. He said, I have to respectfully disagree. Uh, Nuno Betancourt is one of the greats for sure. However, there is very, very little Slash couldn't do on guitar if he wanted to. I toured with Rihanna prior to Nuno. So when Richard uh, left to be in like GNR, I, I think it's, uh, he left the Rihanna gig or, was, or went to Dead Daisies, I forget. But anyway, when he left Rihanna, that's when Nuno took over that gig. So he says, I toured with Rihanna prior to Nuno, and I've spent a lot of time playing with Slash. Obviously, this gig wouldn't be a struggle for him. That's all he said. Right. So, so uh, this will take up too much time, and so I have to paraphrase it. So, if you want to look later, but Nuno Betancourt responded at length on uh, Facebook and Instagram. He's like, "I'm responding to this not because I give a shit about what this this guitarist thinks about me. Um, for this, I've respectfully never heard of you play. Uh, never heard you play one note in my 56 years of being alive." Uh, I'm sure you're a decent player. Uh, he calls him just a, a replacement player. He's like, I've only known your name from the Rihanna camp and, and as a, repl a re replacement player in guns when he's been in the band for 20 years. Uh, so he took shots, I, I, I think. So that kind of. Wow. Right. W wow. Right. That wasn't. Definitely, definitely like took it to a whole other level that I don't think was really. Uh, okay was going to right so i think what you so what like his nuno's initial comments fine you may disagree fine you agree you worked with slash you agree fortis has worked with slash he doesn't agree that's fine that's all conversation but nuno is responding like what, that semantics like what is there like one is saying one thing and the other is there apples and oranges. like yeah of course he could do it technically obviously it's like one of the greatest guitarists ever like he could play whatever if it's physically possible to play it, Slash can fucking play it. That's not what he was saying. He was just saying it's weird. You have to play something that has nothing to do with anything that you ever do. You have to probably do it perfectly. You have to do the same thing every night. You have to fit in with a background band as a sideline guy. Make some pop music. Yeah, no, Slash, it probably would be very difficult for Slash to, to lower himself to that level. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and that's absolutely fair. And and that, I appreciate your opinion. And let me just say, and I'm not expecting uh an answer, but I did reach out because I was uh denied an extreme interview once they passed, and then I reached out again uh just a few hours ago, uh, just to see. I'm like, hey, figured I'd take a stab again. If they with all this negative press, let's put a positive spin on it if you want to come on. And I was told it was forwarded to their management. So if I don't hear back, that's a no. <laughs> so, You're not. Uh, what's that? Who, who did you reach out to? I read. I first it was uh well both at the at the first it was either Gary Sharon or Nuno Betancourt. I didn't care. I got one of those press releases for their new album, and then now specifically Nuno being like, this yeah. could be. I don't know. I'm sure. At the end of the day, does anybody really care? Slash, I'm sure isn't losing any sleep. Is Nuno really losing any sleep over this? But I don't know. I want to. I would like to put a positive spin on it. If you know, if he's up to it. Well, Newsday in the rock world. So <laughs> talk about we're talking about some silly nonsense. I know. So let me get your opinion on this with slow news days. And I, I would be remiss uh, because I, I talked with you this off the air. 
almost like a to be continued because it's always a slow news day or maybe not with Guns N' Roses this summer. Of course, touring, but there are rumors of uh, with new Guns N' Roses music. I will mention, uh, mention this, though. Slash coming out with a new album with different singers, uh, a blues album, which I think that's great news. I don't know what that means, if anything, for Guns N' Roses. What do you think about that? Let me get your opinion on that. Slash doing a blues record? Yeah. Fuck yeah, man. That is, that's the best fucking news I've heard in a long time, man. That's fucking cool, man. Right? Right? I th- it, 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 that's, that's awesome. I it, can't wait to see who, who his fucking rhythm, rhythm section is. Oh, man. There have been some rumors, but I, I just don't want to... I think somebody from Snake Pit. I think there was a picture of uh, Johnny G from Snake Pit and uh, uh, Teddy Zigzag. They were in the studio like earlier this year. I don't know if that's related, but it would make sense. You um, should get but, Andreas on keys. Okay. Who, who on keys? I'm sorry, you broke up a bit. Andreas. Did you play with guns? Oh, yeah. Teddy Andreas. Yeah, Teddy Zigzag. As I kill a bug on my desk. Did I get him? Did I get him? No, I didn't. It's great. It's gonna be crawling on me. This is a the this is the beauty of working in uh, in Queens. I, I, I live in Joe's apartment apparently. Uh, for the <laughs> all the the heat has brought up the bugs and it sucks. We'll see how many viewers comment below if you have any idea of what we're talking about when we say Joe's apartment. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you got that reference. <laughs> That's a super center. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, uh, well, that's. So that's that's cool. Yeah, and everyone had that kind of the same response more than just I think it's a bigger response if more than uh, Slashers had a new album with different singers. But the fact that this is a blues record, too, on top of that, I think it's gotten people excited. But I asked you before, because the big news, obviously, is Guns N' Roses. That's the big uh, matzo ball hanging out. You know, will they won't they kind of situation. Uh, but <laughs> so there was a video of and You said, you know, who uh, Tom Mayhew is. There are a lot. Uh, so you you've met him. Like he seems like a nice guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We toured together with Bell Revolver. He was a production manager. So I've known him for 15, 20 years. Yeah, he's one of my good friends. And his brother, which was great, but uh, McBob, and a couple. Uh, it didn't happen when I saw them in the small club. Uh, no, it did. It happened in both a small club in New Jersey. I remember. And when I saw them again in West Palm Beach, he would do a different take of the Guns N' Roses intro. Yeah, he's like, you wanted the best. Well, they ain't fucking make it. <laughs> you know, here's what you get. Velvet Revolver. You know, it's so gr- great. It's just a great to bring back this, this classic Guns N' Roses bit, but put a velvet spin on it. Yeah. So Tom Mayhew was recently videotaped on a GNR uh, VIP tour talking about specifically Guns N' Roses music, how there should be music out any day now. Uh, they are working on it. It's, it could sound like Appetite. It's going to be a mix of things, all these great things. And much like some other GNR uh, news that have been out there about new music, and I know this from experience with my interviews, it was taken down. I wanted to clear up last time from what I, my understanding is that management had nothing to do with this, that this had to do with the fan not wanting all that attention. So I wanted to make sure I brought that up as somebody who pretends to be, I mean, I have a journalism degree. I don't know if you call me a journalist anymore. I'm just a, uh, you know, but anyway, uh, so I'm just, I'm just curious, because uh, have you been following any of that? I mean, I don't know if you keep in touch with Slash and Duff like that. So if they talk to you about music uh, still, and it's because they both are putting out music. We talk about Slash, Duff's yeah. putting out music, GNR. We we don't know. We only get rumors that are taken down. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, no, I don't really keep in touch with those guys too much. You know, um, I will text Slash sometimes, or I text uh, Duff sometimes on his on his birthday or you know we exchange the random funny text message or something if i send it to him and and whatever uh and he always responds and i love those guys they're great i slash goes through a lot of phone numbers so i don't i don't have a number for him anymore but no i didn't i didn't even know they were recording you know Oh, that's uh, another part of just you're here as not not only my guest but i guess my my co-host as well because I want to get your opinion on things because you are a producer. So with that in mind, I don't want to keep you here forever as apparently a bugs on my home studio. Damn it. Uh, where, what are you doing now? What, who are you working with and what's going on with you? 
you know, all, all, all the who, what, when, where, why uh, questions of, of Nashville and what's the most up to date of Rocco Guarino. Um, yeah, man, Nashville. Been there since uh, like I rolled in town Friday the 13th, January, Friday the 13th. And uh, I'm starting my label. Uh, it's called Starlight Records. And uh, cool. see it there. I see the logo on your laptop back there. Um, yeah. So basically, I had I had a bunch of bands that uh, that I had produced a bunch of records that I had made um, from probably 2014 up until 2021 that had never come out that were never released for one reason or another obviously some of them were from the pandemic so they never were released but a lot of more whether the band broke up or there was one um vox waves or they changed your name to turquoise noise and scott passed away so that album never came out and um another band called windows that i did at phonogenic um when i was at ronnie Jaffe's studio the first fighters um keyboard player and two more that I had done since I left there. So there was just a bunch of records that had never been released. And I thought it was kind of crazy that, you know, that, that, that this was happening. So anyway, I just called everybody and said, Hey, I want to start a label and put out, can, can I put out the record? And everybody all the way down the line, everybody said, yes. Awesome. So, yeah. So I have a uh, 14 artists. Nice. Uh, on the label and we're just kind of it's just you know me and and instagram and uh and my brain you know that's really where starlight lives right now until uh until we start you know launching properly but for now it's just it's all about good music you know it's it's highly curated um if anything comes out of starlight it's going to be music that i absolutely love and also happen to be pretty much every album on my label I've produced. <laughs> so there's that. But, you know, eventually we'll be we'll be working with uh, other producers as well, too, you know. As well. All, right. All right, cool. So if you want to check out the latest, it's just Starlight on Instagram or is it Starlight something else? So what's the exact uh, handle? Uh, I'll put it up, though, in the, in the, uh, the bio. I don't remember what the Instagram is. Oh, but good. My <laughs> rock rock of music instagram um there's a link in there a link tree there okay okay cool starlight is at p-a-r-l-i-t oh okay i'm glad you specified that yeah okay good uh and then of course the the previously mentioned tiktok you're on there as rocco uh rocco rocco uh, guarino right or rocco music yeah rocco music yeah, it displays. I don't know the username is Rocco Music, but yeah, I'm, all of my social media, everything is Rocco Music. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, yeah. Even well, even the never used X for you, uh, Twitter. So uh, I don't want to keep you here forever. Uh, I feel now. I feel bad for my wife. She's. I had just been watching Baby Brownstone all day. Uh, <laughs> oh, you like that nickname? So I yeah. love it. And it's it's so funny. Well, I have a spinoff podcast too because I love horror movies. Okay. So trying to do that, and I don't know what's absorbing into his brain now because I watch horror movies when I'm not online talking about Guns N' Roses or doing this. So I have an upcoming interview uh, with somebody who wrote uh, an Exorcist book, and oh, wow. I was I was reading him. I think that might be the first book I ever read him was reading him the Fifty Years of the Exorcist. Oh. He just likes hearing my voice. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I know my wife's stuck in the bedroom with, uh, with him, so I don't want to keep her there forever. See, this is the realness that you get from Appetite for Distortion. You got bugs. You got babies crying. Rocco is always honest. I got honest guests. This is what it's like because this is a uh, this is why Axel would never do this podcast. You see the picture of Joe Rogan and Axel. Where Joe Rogan looks so happy as anybody would be meet, meeting Axel, and Axel looks like he just like hates life. <laughs> he was on Joe Rogan's podca podcast. He wasn't on the podcast. He randomly met him in Greece. Oh, oh, yeah. So, and actually, before we wrap up, I want to mention we're going to do a a fan review with a couple of fans from Greece who were at that concert, where 
I couldn't believe it. I mean, we can believe it now, I guess, with the all these years of reunion. Uh, Axel uh, leading a happy birthday uh, song to Slash on stage. Yeah. All those years they hated each other. At least Axel hated him, and now they're they love each other. It's cool. It is cool. It is cool. Uh, Rocco, let's do this again. Let's not wait a couple of years before you come back. Okay. Yeah, man. <laughs> okay, cool. So that does it for this episode of Appetite for Distortion. Remember, the conversation continues in between the broadcasts. You got Facebook, you got Twitter X, whatever it is, Instagram, even TikTok. Not threads yet. If you're on threads, let me know if this is something I should do. I have enough. I have a child, for God's sake. I can only do so much. And also, please follow on YouTube because I'm always old, uh, editing old clips, making them all fresh and real and cool and uh, bite-sized one minute clips like i've done with a couple of your uh a couple of your things you've done rocco and it's it's awesome it really is fun to go back yeah. and relive these episodes and make them put pictures on them and i don't know it's always when i'm scrolling through uh tiktok and then i pop up and i'm like that's me <laughs> that's <so cool. laughs> i like that i do like that uh cool so until the next episode of appetite when will you see it in the words of axel rose concerning chinese democracy i don't know if soon is the word but you'll see it <laughs>